Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Peter, amen. Amen. Thank you. Our speaker this evening is a professor of literature and writer in residence at Magdalen College of the Liberal Arts. Dr. Anthony Esselin is a senior editor at Chronicles Magazine and Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity, and his work appears regularly in Magnificat, Public Discourse, First Things, Crisis Magazine, Catholic World Report, and The Catholic Thing, among many others. Known for his three-volume verse translation of the modern library edition of Dante's Divine Comedy, Professor Esselin has also written verse translations of Torquato Tasso's epic poem, Jerusalem Delivered, and of Lucretius's On the Nature of Things. He is the author of, at last count, 25 books, including his own book-length sacred poem, The Hundredfold Songs for the Lord, a series of 100 poems and dramatic monologues interspersed with two dozen of his own beautifully written hymns. He is the recipient of this year's Searcy Institute Russell Kirk Paideia Prize, given in honor of a lifetime dedicated to the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. It is a great honor to welcome back to the Institute, Dr. Anthony Esselin. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Father. Uh, I've sometimes heard Christians say uh, when they criticize our current time that, that we're uh, reverting to paganism, we're returning to paganism. I could only wish that we were, okay? I only wish it were so. It would be much better than what is actually happening. Um, we Christians have many centuries of experience bringing to pagans, good, honest to God pagans, good news of Jesus Christ. The pagans knew the natural virtues. And one natural virtue I'm going to talk about in particular tonight is piety. It's a virtue I have in mind. Uh, they knew these virtues, though, of course, the bent of original sin kept them both from knowing them in their pure form and from following reliably even what they did know. But I want us all to recall this, uh, this principle um, when we evaluate the state of things such as we find them right now. That is, the corruption of the best is the worst. That corruptio optimi pessima est, right? The better a thing is in its nature. The worse it is when it's corrupted. C.S. Lewis had this principle in mind when he said, a bad man is worse than a bad dog. An evil angel is worse than both, immeasurably worse. So society that used to be Christian is far worse than the society that is not yet Christian. Pagan piety, natural to mankind, is like bedrock upon which to build a cathedral. Grace affirms and builds upon nature. But what used to be Christian piety is not natural. Uh, what that is, I'll maybe get to at the end of my talk tonight. Neither a cathedral, nor a pagan temple, nor a senate chamber, nor even an ordinary human village can be built upon that. That is, on what used to be Christian piety, but is now something quite demonic. OK, um, let me explain the first part of this, that is the natural virtues of piety by turning to um, a couple of the greatest poems of ancient Greece and Rome. All right. And the first one that I have in mind here is the Iliad. OK, a uh, good friend of mine, a devout Catholic, uh, the historian James Hitchcock, once said to me that this poem is pagan through and through. Uh, I agree with that, and yet I hesitate because it's pagan through and through in its ethos, and yet, at the end of the Iliad, it seems as if it's pagan with some kind of opening uh, towards a world that is bigger than the pagan world. Um, you may remember that uh, Achilles in the Iliad has, um, has uh, sulked in his tent because of the offense done to him by the leader of the Greek uh, armies, Agamemnon. Um, he's been moved to come out 
not by not by pleas that he should have mercy upon his own men, uh, upon the men that he has fought alongside, uh, that he should pay attention to what his father told him back in Greece. Um, it, it, he's not moved by that, or even by Agamemnon's expressing his regrets and trying to undo the harm. Um, he's moved only by the death of his best friend, Patroclus. And uh, in his battle that follows upon the death of Patroclus, he's absolutely merciless, okay? Um, when his principal opponent from Troy, Hector, pleads with him, okay, it is dying breath because the spear has gone right through his neck. Achilles has chased him three times around the city in full sight of Hector's uh, uh, mother and father up on the ramparts, chased him three times around the city. Finally, uh, they they come to single combat and Hector thrusts, or, or Achilles thrusts his lance and it pierces Hector's neck right through, but manages to avoid the windpipe so that Hector can breathe out a couple of last words. Hector begs him to return his body, his corpse, to uh, his mother and father and his wife back in the city. And Achilles, relentless as death, okay, says, no, I will give you to the birds and the dogs to eat. Okay, I, I'm, I am glutting myself with vengeance, no. And, and at that point, he, um, he kills Hector. And he pierces Hector's ankles, uh, straps a thong through them, and ties Hector to the back of his chariot. And he drags Hector's body through the dust around Troy three times for every time he had to run around the city chasing Hector. And he does this day after day after day. And only the gods keep Hector's body intact. Now, the very end of the poem, this old man, Priam, the king of Troy, who's had 50 sons, 50 daughters. Most of the sons are dead by this point, okay? This Priam is moved by the gods to go outside the city at night as a beggar to enter Achilles' tent, okay? And to beg for the body back, right? In other words, to well, it would reincorporate Achilles into the world of human beings, not a world in which he is as relentless as the god that everybody hates, including all the other gods, that is the god called death. So uh, I'm reading from uh, the translation of Flannery O'Connor's friend, Robert Fitzgerald. Priam, the great king of Troy, passed by the others, knelt down, took in his arms Achilles' knees, and kissed the hands of wrath that kissed that killed his sons. Achilles gazed in wonder at the splendid king, and his companions marveled too, all silent, with glances to and fro. Now Priam prayed to the man before him, remember your own father, Achilles, in your godlike youth. His years like mine are heavy, and he stands upon the fearful doorstep of old age. He too is hard pressed, it may be, by those around him, there being no one able to defend him from bane of war and ruin. Ah, but he may nonetheless hear news of you alive, and so with glad heart, hope through all his days for sight of his dear son come back from Troy, while I have deadly fortune. Achilles, be reverent toward the great gods, and take pity on me. Remember your own father. Think me more pitiful by far, since I have brought myself to do what no man else has done before, to lift my lip to my lips the hand of one who killed my son. Now Achilles has made a fateful decision. Priam is not aware of this. Uh, he could win eternal glory, but will die on the battlefield round Troy and never see his father or his son again. Or he can go back to Thea, his homeland, across the Aegean, and dwell with his father and his son and live a happy and human life, and then be forgotten with his death. And Achilles has made the fateful choice for fame, 
and it eats him up inside. Priam, of course, does not know any of this. Now in Achilles, the evocation of his father stirred new longing and an ache for grief. He lifted the old man's hand and gently put him by. Then both were overborne as they remembered. The old king huddled at Achilles' feet wept and wept for Hector, killer of men, while great Achilles wept for his own father as for Patroclus once again, and sobbing filled the room. And Achilles grants Priam's request. So at one point, in fact, he says to Priam, I behold you and you seem to me as a god. And it's a very strange thing to say, because elsewhere in the poem, in typical pagan style, when some man appears as a god, he appears in power, glory, god on the battlefield, sweeping everything before him, killing left and right. And now it all builds up to this final scene at the end of the poem. And who is described as appearing like a god? But a bent, frail, suffering old man. Okay. Uh, the, the virtue of piety is front and center here. Uh, Achilles is at best an ambivalent, uh, an ambivalent symbol of piety. Uh, he has made that choice, as I say. Okay. It's, it's a choice that he is not happy with. Right. Um, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus speaks to the ghost of Achilles in the underworld, uh, Odysseus will say to him, Achilles, you are uh, we all remember you. We all honor you. You must be greatly honored here among all the warriors down below. And Achilles says, I would rather be the hired man of a tenant farmer on earth alive than to be king of all the speechless dead. Um, as he, this is not a choice that, that, that fills him with happiness. But the piety here is a piety that acknowledges bonds of duty to your father, okay, uh, and ultimately beyond your father to your country, as we're going to see when I would take a look at uh, uh, the Aeneid, and to the great gods the gods above, okay? Um, if that is in the mind of your pagan society, every pagan society that you go to has something like this, okay? Well, you can build on that, obviously. This is natural to mankind. It is not natural to mankind to tear down statues of their own fathers. There's something bizarre and suicidal about that. It's natural mankind to revere their fathers, to overlook their shortcomings, and to praise their virtues, and to try to see in them some guidance as to how they themselves are to live. Go to China. Uh, read Confucius. It's the same. Go, go to the Japanese and their ancestral uh, religion, Shinto. It's the same. Okay, The Japanese Shinto will understand this. We're the weird ones. We're the outliers. I'm going to give you a different uh, uh, a picture of piety here, uh, also from Homer. Now, this is from the Odyssey, okay? Um, now, uh, the, the, the Greeks, the Greeks, uh, I would just say this by the way, and this has something to do with what I'm talking about here. The Greeks had an interesting word um, uh, to denote somebody who's all wrapped up in his own business, and did not give of himself to the common good, was not concerned with what everybody else was doing, did not participate in the government of their, you know, small cities, their villages, and so forth. Person who's all wrapped up in his own business is an idiot, okay? That's what the word means, okay? Um, the uh, life of Odysseus, apart from his warriors, okay, and apart from Ithaca, where he's trying to return to, is the life of an idiot, and it does not make him happy. We first see him in the poem on an island that is in the control of a nymph, a goddess named Calypso. And her name, uh, the form of her name suggests hiding, 
uh, stashing away, okay? Um, and in fact, Odysseus is sort of secreted here. Nobody knows where it is. Uh, and his manhood is, so to speak, undercover, under wraps. His very humanity is being smothered. But it's a perfectly hedonistic life, right? Um, if all you want out of life is uh, physical pleasure, this is it. Calypso is offering him, has offered him, immortal youth. He won't die. He won't grow old. He can stay on the island with her. Plenty to eat, plenty to drink, and she'd be in bed with him every night. Okay? And Odysseus doesn't want that. Right? Uh, here we see him right first. And the picture of his manhood here is his manhood checked or thwarted. He was seated along the shore. His eyes were never dry. And his sweet life was squandered as he wept for his dear home. He now took no delight in Calypso. The nymph no longer pleased his sight. By night, indeed, within Calypso's cave, he slept with her. So side by side they lay, the willing and unwilling. But by day, his heart was rent by torment. As he sat along the sands or on the rocks, he watched the never-resting sea. And watching, wept. Okay. Now, uh, it never said, uh, Homer never says in the poem that Ithaca is a splendid place, right? Though the little we are told about Ithaca is that um, uh, it's kind of rocky, not particularly good for riding horses. Um, it's you know, the soil is, is rich enough for some farming. Uh, it, it, it's not, we're not talking about Athens here. We're not talking about um, uh, even the richest farmland in the world. What pulls, Ithaca, what pulls Odysseus to Ithaca uh, is not anything picturesque about it or anything particularly valuable. It's that it's his place, okay? He belongs there. He owes it to the people to return there. That's where he's supposed to be. That's where he's supposed to grow old and die. Okay. Um, and this feeling of, uh, well, this fidelity to, or this feeling that you owe an obligation to those who have come before you, to your father, right? And your father's father and so on. This is the natural virtue of piety, okay? Um, so when Odysseus, when Odysseus finally does come back, get back to Ithaca, uh, he uh, he wants to check everybody out, all right? Um, and he has to, in fact, check everybody out because 108 men, uh, suitors for the hand of his wife, Penelope, have uh, burdened his family estate with themselves, with their feeding habits. Um, they, are, they are hedonists. They don't care either about the common good or about um, the loyalty that they ought to owe to Odysseus. Some of them remember him when they were little boys. They're old enough to remember him, okay? And they've forgotten all of that. Um, they are the, the classic idiots living for pleasure, okay? Pleasure seekers, they're idiots. Um, oh, there's 108 of them, and there's only one of him, so he has to go in disguise. And here he is uh, uh, meeting a swineherd, a herder of hogs uh, that he has on his estate, the old man Eumaeus. Um, and uh, the, the uh, Odysseus, as a beggar, in disguise as a beggar, tells Eumaeus, you know, I've seen Odysseus, he's coming back. Eumaeus finds it too, too, uh, too good to be true. Okay. Other people have said the same thing, and it's always been a lie. Uh, it's too good to be true. But, it, it's, but in the conversation that he has with Odysseus, it's brought out that Eumaeus is not native to Ithaca. Uh, he had to escape from his homeland because of homicide. Um, he was brought in by Odysseus's father. He, he's much favored by the old man Laertes, by Odysseus's wife Penelope, and he has grown thoroughly loyal to that family, 
Okay, so he is himself an embodiment of piety. And this is this is Eumaeus now speaking. Un, he doesn't know it, but he's speaking to Odysseus himself. Yes, he's died far off. And long lament is all that's left for those who loved him so. Above all, me. I'll never find a master. Maybe this should be done in Tennessee accent there. I'll never find a master as gentle as he was. No matter where I go. Not even if I should return to my own father's and my mother's home where I was born, where they nurtured me. But I'm not heart sick for my family, though, though I do want to see them and to be in my own land. It is for him I long. Odysseus, distant one. Though he's gone, dear guest, I, I, I hesitate to name him. For he cherished me most lovingly. And I call him my Lord, though he's not here. Stunning lines. Okay? Can you imagine someone in our own time where you are supposed to be yourself, an individual, and owe no bonds of loyalty to anybody. Certainly not the bond of loyalty that keeps you as a herder of pigs on an estate where the master's been gone for almost 20 years. And it com comes out in the course of the poem that Eumaeus has been so successful in raising the swine that I mean, he's had the chance to take some of the flock with Penelope's blessing and set off on his own. And he's, he's refused. He has declined. Okay. There's piety for you. And we can build on that. Um, piety, doing your duty towards your forebears. In this case, the, uh, the father of the estate, the head of this household, who is your master and who was kind to you, doing your duty towards him. Now, Odysseus finally, uh, with the help of Eumaeus, and uh, another uh, uh, loyal servant, a cowherd, and the help of his son Telemachus, who gets the wonderful joy of fighting right next to his father. I mean, my father died when I was um, uh, when I was only uh, 31 years old. You know, we did a lot of things together, my father and I, when I was a boy. But one thing I never got to do with him, um, I never got to help him kill our enemies, you know, uh, to stand beside dad in battle and to kill the enemy. I never got to do that. Um, other kids get to do that, I suppose. But anyway, uh, they, he, has, he has killed the 108 uh, suitors. And now there remains one person to whom he must reveal himself, and that's his wife, Penelope. And she, uh, she is a worthy wife of Odysseus. She's very clever, um, very strong-willed. And she seems to believe that it is Odysseus after all, but she's not going to be fooled. And she tests him. She says, ah, oh, yes, I do believe that you're Odysseus. And then she, she asks, she orders some servants to take the bed from their room and move it out into the hall. And at that point, there's, there's a test. And we are not told anything about this bed. It's a complete surprise to us, too. Uh, at this, Odysseus loses his temper and says, what a woman! And then he tells about the bed. And the bed is a phenomenal symbol. Almost better than anything that I have read from any Christian in my lifetime about what marriage is. A phenomenal symbol of now marital piety. Says Odysseus, when I was building this uh, manor house, which I built with my own hands, uh, this happened. Within our court, a long-leaved olive trunk stood stout and vigorous, just like a pillar. If I could do Sean Connery, I think Sean Connery in his youth would play Odysseus. Around that trunk, I built our bridal room. I finished it with close-set stones and laid a sturdy roof above. I added doors that fitted faultlessly. Then I lopped off the olive's long-leaved limbs. And so I thinned the trunk up from its base. 
With my bronze adze, I smoothed it down with craft and care. I made that wood run true and straight, and it became my bedpost. Once I had bored it with an auger, I, starting with that part, began to shape my frame. And with that job well done, inlaid my work with silver, ivory, and gold. No one but Penelope knows about this. Only he and his wife know the secret of the bed. That is that one of the bedposts is the trunk of an olive tree, right? Uh, with the branches lopped off, planed, smoothed, make to look just like the other three posts. The bed is built accordingly, and the room is built round the bed. And the manor house, of course, round the room. Um, the bed can't be moved without being destroyed. Okay. And he did that to live. What a remarkable symbol of the permanence of marriage, right? And at that point, Penelope knows it's Odysseus. And they spend the entire night in that secret place. Talking about the sufferings they've endured over the 20 years and doing other things besides talking all the night through. Uh, we can build on that, right? Um, what does piety mean with the uh, regard to uh, your own nation? Um, there I'm going to pick up a famous, very famous passage from the Aeneid, okay? Uh, this is now Virgil here, and we're in Rome. Um, after very troubled times for the Roman state, uh, Augustus Caesar has taken charge of everything and commissions Virgil to write an epic, uh, a Roman epic that would be the equal of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Virgil has tried to comply with his work, the Aeneid. Um, Aeneas at this point in the poem is telling, is in Carthage, the new city of north of Africa, the name means new city. Uh, built by a refugee from Phoenicia, um, where she'd been, uh, Dido, the Queen Dido, where she had been driven out by the wickedness of her own brother, impiety, okay, of her own brother who murdered her husband uh, in, in order to uh, gain his money. Um, so uh, uh, Dido has welcomed Aeneas and his fellow Trojan refugees in. Troy has fallen. And these guys, these, these, these Trojans led by Aeneas are seeking a new homeland. That new homeland is going to be the uh, peninsula of Italy. Okay. Um, he's now describing to her what that last, uh, uh, what that last evening was like. Okay. Um, and um, uh, uh, he goes back home. Every, everything's lost. The city, the city's gone. He's been told by his mother, the goddess Venus, to get his family out of there, to uh, save some refugees. Uh, they're going to be a great race someday, but you've got to get out of Troy. You've got to set sail. So he goes back home, and there's his father. Um, his father is lame, right? Uh, that is a punishment for his having um, uh, had uh, relations with the goddess Venus. So he's an old cripple. But he's the priest of this household. He's the old man of the household, the priest. And um, Aeneas says to him, Father, we have to leave. Okay. And I've always, I've always done this. I, I don't think I've done this for you. I did this for another group recently. But I, I always said to my students, you got to play Anchises. You, you got to play him as an old Italian guy. Okay. I'm reading ancient Roman poetry. It seems like nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Uh, he's an old Italian guy. He says, oh, Dad, we got to leave. And Dad says, no. No, 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 no. I'm an old man. I must stay here. It's my house. I'm going to die here in my house. You, you're young. You'll go. I must stay. Okay. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and he says, Dad, Dad, they're coming. There's a burning. No, no, no. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. 
I, I, you go, I'm going stay, to I'm stay all right. And it takes a sign from the heavens to get Anchises to move. Flame that does not burn descends upon the head of his grandson. And um, it's all at once. And Kai says, oh, it's a sign. It's a sign of I'm a habit. I'm a go. I'm a go. Okay. Uh, so, um, so Anchises, Anchises uh, uh, agrees, and Aeneas is now going to have to carry him because he, the old man's a cripple, right? Um, carry him on his shoulders. And if you want to see this uh, scene portrayed marvelously, just uh, do an internet search afterwards. Type in Bernini Aeneas. And you will see the great sculpture of this moment here, because uh, Aeneas uh, has to carry the old man, but the old man is carrying something too. So let me let me read the words here. Um, uh, it says Aeneas, at the gate in land, there's a funeral mound and an old shrine of Ceres the bereft, near it an ancient cypress kept alive for many years by our father's piety. By various routes, we'll come to that one place. Father, carry our hearth gods, our penates. It would be wrong for me to handle them. Just come from such hard fighting, bloody work, until I wash myself in running water. When I had said this over my breadth of shoulder and bent neck, I spread out a lion skin for tawny cloak and stooped to take his weight. Then little Eulus, little boy, the grandson, put his hand in mine and came with shorter steps beside his father. Now, um, what Virgil has done here is project back into the Trojans something that Greeks and Trojans did not actually have in their religion, but the Romans had in theirs. When your ancestors pass away, uh, they become the household gods, okay? Um, you, um, on festival days, you take out perhaps little figurines that represent them. You put them on the mantle above the fire, the hearth, the central uh, area in your house, but, you know, it, the, the word for hearth in uh, uh, Latin is focus, and that's where we get our word from, right? Um, so you, uh, if you're rich, if you're rich, you may get a sculptor to sculpt a bust of Uncle Vinny, okay, um, from a death mask that you would make, if you know, make a, a kind of clay or plas plaster mask, and from that mask, he would sculpt Uncle Vito, uh, and so forth. Um, and you, as a child, will be, so to speak, always watched by the eyes of these protective and admonitory household gods, right? Women are part of this system, too. Um, so Anchises is carrying the figurines. He's carrying the past the household gods. Aeneas is carrying him. Put the lion skin around his shoulders so the old man can rest well while he's uh, taking the little boy in his hands and, and moving on. Um, that's thorough piety, right? And you look at that and you see Romans say, that's what it means. That's what it means. Piety is uh, the a virtue that requires you to fulfill your obligations to your father, that includes your mother, right? Includes your ancestors, generally, both sexes. Um, to uh, your fatherland, that is your patria, your country. To the household gods and to the great gods, okay? Uh, something similar in its different flavor is what missionaries found when they came to the new world. Uh, uh, and uh, they, 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 they met the Indians in their tribes, right? Um, no, you, you, you did not have to say to the Indians, oh, you stupid Indians, um, you are worshiping a father who is now a god to you. Um, they would say, Indians, you're honoring your father. That is good and a holy thing. Now let us reveal to you the Father, right? Uh, it was not so much a destruction of everything that they believed before, but a correction and then an amplification, okay? Um, more from uh, Virgil, this, this, um, this, uh, uh, this piety does not, is not guaranteed to bring you happiness in this life, right? 
Again, remember, if Odysseus was out for pleasure in this life, he'd still be on Calypso's island. Okay? Aeneas is not promised any far from pleasure in this life. He's not even promised happiness. We know uh, that he is going to die, oh, seven or eight years after um, he settles his people on the peninsula of Italy. Uh, that settling will not occur without war, all right? Um, so it's not happiness that's in store for him, not earthly happiness. But it doesn't matter to the, uh, to the man of piety. What matters is your duty, okay? This is something that you owe, you must do. So now we're in the last book of the Aeneid, right? Uh, and Aeneas is, Aeneas has retired momentarily from battle uh, because he'd been wounded pretty badly in the knee. Uh, divine intervention uh, gets the arrowhead out of there and he's preparing to return to the battle, okay? Um, and he says this to his son, who is now, a, you know, He's not a little boy anymore. He's actually taken a little part in the fighting. This, these are his. This is the last words of father to son, in the poem. Okay, Aeneas will survive the battle, but this is the last scene we get with father and son. And Aeneas says this to him: "Learn fortitude and toil from me, my son. Ache of true toil. Good fortune, learn from others." My sword arm now will be your shield in battle and introduce you to the boons of war. When before long you come to man's estate, be sure that you recall this. Harking back for models in your family, let your father Aeneas and uncle Hector stir your heart. This is what you can learn from me, my son. Learn courage that is uh, actually manhood, it's virtutum. Um, how, how does it go? Disque puer virtutum ex me, verumque laborem. Learn from me, my boy. Manhood, virtue, manliness, and true labor. Good fortune you can learn from someone else. If you're going to learn about good fortune, you're going to have to go to someone else because I've never had any. This is what I have to teach you. Virtutum et verum laborum, verumque laborum, true labor. Okay. Now, if that is an animating principle in your society, even if, you know, even if people fail to live up to it, if they acknowledge it, if they make some effort, even if they acknowledge it in a hypocritical way, right? I mean, sometimes you got to thank God for hypocrisy because the alternative might be a great deal worse. Uh, th this is something, all right? Um, this is something, this is again, something to build upon, okay? Now, it seems to me uh, that uh, in, in both the, in the cases of, um, uh, Odysseus and uh, Aeneas. We have people on the move trying to get somewhere, but the somewhere that they're getting to is, uh, well, in the one case, it's back to a place, right, to the place where you belong, without any sense that Ithaca is ever going to be any more than Ithaca, okay? Um, you belong there, and so you should go. Uh, with Aeneas, the, since they no longer have a homeland at all, uh, the, the, the quest, the, the travel is to go to a new place, right, and to settle there. Now, there's the sense that something great will come of it, namely the Roman Empire, Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. But if you, if you, if you look at, if you look at uh, things further... Uh, you see that the, the Romans did not have in mind anything beyond what they already enjoyed, right? I mean, there was no idea among the Romans that 
this Roman Empire, such as we have now, is but the stepping stone to bigger and greater things. It was this that we have now we're going to keep. And uh, we're going to be loyal to it. We're going to preserve it. All right. Um, to actually set out on a journey that is a real pilgrimage. Okay. Uh, but that yet loses nothing of the ancient piety that roots you in one place. We're going to have we're going to have to have the the Jewish and then the Christian faith. Okay. Um, and think about the difference between Odysseus, who longs to get back home, and rightly so, because it's where he belongs, and the Christian soul that longs for a home that we have never seen, right? Um, for whom every home in this world is, in one sense, like a way station, but in another sense, really is home, okay? Um uh, there is something interesting that C.S. Lewis has to say about it. G.K. Chesterton is, says the same kinds of things in different ways. Uh, seek for heaven and you get earth into the bargain. Uh, seek for earth alone and you lose them both. Um, seek for heaven and you get earth into the bargain implies also that those who uh, commit themselves to their heavenly home will be most likely to have a true and stable and good and sweet home home here in this life and nothing of that home here in this life nothing good from that will be lost forever okay the vision that saint john sees of the heavenly jerusalem descending from above as a bride dis, uh, adorned for the bridegroom is of a new heaven and new earth okay not of a new heaven and forget about the earth, we're glad it's gone. Um, that's not that it is not it at all. We want all the good that the natural human being knows, that God has made us to know and to love. And we are promised that, I think. It's implicit in all the gospel promises and in St. Paul. It's implicit in the resurrection of the flesh, not a disembodied soul. It's implicit or maybe explicit in St. John's vision of the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and new earth. So now I'm going to a poem. This is a medieval poem, right? And uh, once again, we've got, we've got uh, a longing that separates one generation from another, okay? Uh, and Chises, the old man, is going to be lost uh, by Aeneas. He's going to die before they ever reach... Italy, okay. It's it's a blow that Aeneas hasn't doesn't have words to describe how sad it makes him. All right, uh, Achilles never going to see his father again. He's going to die on the battlefield of Troy. Priam is not going to see his son Hector again. Odysseus does see Telemachus again. Is reunited with the with the now young man who was a baby boy when he left. Uh, nearly 20 years before. I mean, this is a medieval poem called Pearl. Have you ever heard of it? Okay, this is, in my uh, opinion, uh, uh, for its technical virtuosity, okay, a unique poem in any language that I have any experience of, the greatest masterpiece of technical virtuosity in the English language. Uh, it is 1,212 lines long of 101 stanzas of 12 lines each. Uh, that's just scratching the surface of its uh, structural complexity. And um, it is about the kingdom of God. It's about the heavenly Jerusalem and the 144,000 uh, virgins that uh, St. John sees in the apocalypse. And it's about a man who has lost his pearl. Uh, his pearl of great price, which we find out to our mounting, uh, well, uh, almost speechless shock and poignancy, is the little girl, his daughter, who died before she was even two years old and was the pearl, her name, we may think, Margaret meaning pearl, 
was buried in the graveyard and he goes to the graveyard to visit to the ground he poet leaves it ambiguous where he lost his pearl and he falls asleep there and he has a vision uh it's in fact a vision of a great river where this river is coming from we will be told much later a great river that separates him on one side of the river from this beautiful land, uh, marvelous sunshine, beautiful fruit trees and cliffs shining in the sun, this magnificent land beyond the river. And he wants to cross the river so beautiful. And then all at once he sees somebody there. And these are the words of the poet. In pearls of price, she moved at east toward the rim of the river that flowed so free. No gladder man from here to Greece than I, that blessed sight to see. This, by the way, is translated into modern English from the Middle English, okay? Uh, let me read it over again. In pearls of price, she moved at east toward the rim of the river that flowed so free. No gladder man from here to Greece than I, that blessed sight to see. She was nearer my heart than aunt or niece. So much the more my joy must be. She proffered parley in sign of peace, bowed womanlike on bended knee, took off her crown of high degree and bade me welcome with courteous voice that I was born, oh, well for me to greet that girl in pearls of price. Oh, pearl, said I, in pearls of price, are you my pearl come back again, lost and lamented with desolate sighs in darkest night alone and in vain? Since you slipped to ground where grasses rise, I wander pensive, oppressed with pain, and you in the bliss of paradise, beyond all passion and strife and strain. What fate removed you from earth's domain and left me hapless and heartsick there? Since parting was set between us twain, I've been a joyless jeweler. And the, whole, the rest of the poem is her being the two-year-old girl, being the spiritual counselor of her own father, okay? They're teaching him about the kingdom of God. And he wants so much to cross that river. Uh, there's a, a, he sees this whole pageant, and his pearl now takes part in the pageant. It's the 144,000 um, that we see in the Apocalypse of John. And his longing to leave behind this earth and to go there at his own prompting is so great that he attempts to cross the river. And as soon as he attempts to do it, the river is gone, the vision is gone, and he awakes at the graveyard. But he awakes wiser now, okay? Uh, steeped in piety, that now has a supernatural aim, uh, a destination, okay? Uh, the site of the pilgrimage that you long to go to, okay? And he says in the final stanza, I, you know, he, he tried to, he tried to cross that river and it was not in the content of his prince, that is Christ. Then he says, finally, to content that prince and well agree, good Christians can with ease incline. For day and night he's proved to be a Lord, a God, a friend benign. These words came over the mound to me as I mourn my pearl so flawless fine. And to God committed her full and free with Christ's dear blessing bestowing mine as in the form of bread and wine is shown us daily in sacrament. Oh, may we serve him well and shine as precious pearls to his content. Uh, it is an extraordinary poem. Um, I once had a girl in class put her head down on the desk after I got five minutes into the poem when it's revealed in that indirect way that this is his daughter. And she didn't raise her head for the whole rest of the class. She was afraid she'd start weeping, all right? Um, my point here in all of this, we maybe can talk a little bit about it. I'm not going anywhere at nine, so we can go overboard a little bit. The pilgrim, the true pilgrim, loves his land and yet is going to his true homeland, right? 
I think that the naturally pious person can understand this. But the post-pilgrim, uh, for want of a better word, I'm going to say progressive here, but I'm, what I mean is a kind of a aggressively secular progressive, right? Progressives didn't used to be that way, but let's just, for want of a better word, has no hope beyond this world. And yet he has set himself against the world. Uh, this is a corruption of Christian contemptus mundi, scorn for worldly things. He hates old and venerable things, right? How often do you see scare quotes or hear them around words like traditional, uh, as if to say antiquated, old-fashioned, dusty? He hates old and venerable things, and he tends to view all of human history as mud or the foul stuff that you have to sometimes scrape from the bottom of your shoes. But when you ask him where he's going, you say, say to such a person, where are we going? What's the destination? He has no answer, but a vague gesture towards some ideal justice, while his own heart is eaten up with all the old rancor of fallen mankind. Where do you catch hold of this person? How do we evangelize the post Christian, who is also post-pagan, post-natural. Where do you catch hold of him? He doesn't worship the wrong God or a wrong or incomplete notion of God. He hardly understands reverence at all. He can't appeal to the example of his fathers. He has repudiated them. He is characterized by a dogged disloyalty. He is loyal to the slanders he heaps upon his own forebears. This is one of the strangest phenomena in the world. Uh, that people should actually be crushed and disappointed to learn that their own ancestors were perhaps not so wicked as they have long thought them to be. That that would, you know, bring gloom to your day to find out that grandpa did not beat grandma up all the time, for example. Uh, yet he can neither redeem his ancestors nor get free of them. He can't expiate what he views as their sins. And he doesn't see his own sins. Of course, it's impossible for such people to build up or to preserve any culture. Because culture implies all those old natural pieties that I've been describing. So this progressive, and I use it for want of a better word, is very good at tearing things down. And he congratulates himself for it. Because he's a horrible sort of saint. He will admit nothing impure. And will forgive no sin. It's always onward, change without end in the most dreadful sense, change with no clear goal, but the phantasms of some worldly perfection that must imply total control from some central director of every necessarily imperfect human person and institution. That I would say, is the kingdom of God on earth whose other name is hell. Uh, these are the people or people who've, who've been told, right? There is nothing to be loyal to, old natural loyalties. And we're going to change. How do we, how do we even begin uh, to bring the truth of God's news, or the good news? Uh, we almost have to slowly make them pagan again. Got to raise them up, perhaps, or reseed them with natural things, um, because uh, they've gone quite demonic. What's post-natural and post-Christian is not pagan, but really something that we've never seen before. We've never seen in 2,000 years. So uh, with that, I think uh, I've gone a little bit overboard here, but uh, we've got some time for questions. And uh, Peter, is it time for me to ask questions here? Wonderful. Answer well, questions? Well, yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Dr. Eslin, from all of us. Uh, it went by way too quickly. Um, you've, you've, you've woven or put together uh, a, a beautiful thread connecting all of these passages 
uh, that ultimately we can bring up into the the Christian tapestry, right? Yeah, by the way, by the way, I want, I want to say something before I forget. All right, the translation that I read from For Pearl is by a woman named Marie Boroff, B-O-R-R-O-F-F. -F. Pearl is written by uh, evidently a priest, okay? Um, and he's the same man that wrote Sir Gawain and the Green Knight hmm. and a couple of other uh, really fine narrative poems. Uh, the, the movie Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, typical of what I'm talking about now. Uh, horrible thing, I've been told, okay? Uh, don't watch the movie, read the poem. And she has translated all the poems by this unknown poet. We don't know who the man's name, we don't have the man's name. Okay, roughly contemporaneous with Ch Chaucer. Okay, writing in Middle English. Uh, so get her translations and her notes on the poems. Also, uh, she she was, I think she was a devout Christian of some sort or other. Um, so the notes are very helpful to uh, people who, you know, actually share the same vision that the um, that the priest who the monk or priest who wrote the poems uh, had. Okay, and and you will be floored by the poem Pearl. It'd be like nothing else that you've ever read in your life. Okay, sorry, sorry, Peter. Do you have favorite translations of these other works that you mentioned? Could you share it for the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid? Uh, yeah, you know, most of the translations are pretty good. Uh, uh, they, they all have their shortcomings, but that's true of every translation. What are you going to say? Uh, the one that I used for the Aeneid is by a guy named Alan Mandelbaum. He's done a lot of, he's translated Dante. I don't think he's done Dante very well, but I think he did Virgil very well. Uh, his Virgil is very good. Um, the, the one from the Iliad was by, um, uh, by Robert Fitzgerald, Flannery O'Connor's friend, right? S the husband of Sally Fitzgerald that Flannery O'Connor writes to all the time. Um, the one of the Odyssey was also by Mr. Mandelbaum, but uh, the Odyssey has been well translated by a bunch of people. Uh, you can hardly you can hardly go wrong. Robert Fagels is the most celebrated now. It's a Princeton professor who passed away a few years ago. Uh, he takes more liberties with the text, but he's uh, he's really quite powerful. Um, so it's hard to go wrong. Right. That's great. Well, that's e equally helpful to know, you know, that if somebody has a, a translation on their shelf, they should just go pick that up and start reading it rather than wait for the perfect one to come around. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, actually, uh, the, the translations that have been done that, that are not, you know, archaic you know, uh, uh, in poetry, not not prose, they've been good. OK, um, I've got nothing to complain about there. But for the poems of the Pearl Poet, go to Marie Boroff, nobody else. Uh, and that includes even our good friend Tolkien. Um, hmm. he, he takes second place in this case. Doctor, let's start with this question. This is from Adam. He asks, you underscored beautifully the recognition scene between Penelope and Odysseus and then mentioned Aeneas's foil with his father. Could you triangulate these two scenes with Odysseus's revelation seen to Laertes in his gar in the garden at the culmination of the Odyssey. Yeah, the uh, you know uh, I've seen Odysseus be blamed for that. I mean, gosh, Odysseus, couldn't you just go up to the old man and say, "Hey, Dad, I'm back," um, but he had to sort of string the old man along. Um, well. The old man, in his way, now participates in the, in the, well, fully in the whole family strife, um, in Odysseus's sorrow. Uh, I mean, poor, poor Laertes uh, breaks down in tears, and then Odysseus disabuses him and says, "No, no, no, Dad, it's me. It's really me." Um, the, the thing about the, that final business in in the Odyssey is that now we don't just have father and son fighting next to each other. We have father and grandfather and son, right? Father, son, and grandson fighting together. And it's Laertes, I believe, who throws the fatal spear at the father of the ringleader 
of the suitors, the, the most obnoxious of the, of, of the other fathers. And in this fashion, and then Athena puts a stop to everything because it would all explode out of hand and uh, Athena comes down and says, that's it, enough. Um, but this is interesting because the, 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 the rightness, the order of the society is restored, right? Um, the, those fathers of those sons should have uh, restrained them, right? They are to blame. They were appealed to directly by um, Telemachus in the early part of the Odyssey, but they didn't do anything, okay? Uh, they were either, they didn't bother with it or they were cowed by the younger men, but they didn't live up to their duty as fathers. And uh, uh, now, now we are going to have the or order restored. I think that that sets Laertes, the old man, into this same uh, into this same system. Poor Laertes has uh, been heartsick over Odysseus. I mean, he bothered hardly ever bothers even to come to the house. It's so miserable. Uh, but now all that will will change. Somebody, I believe, asked. I saw a question flit across my screen. Um, that I uh, had called Odysseus, and, it, and then the word uh, cut off. Um, it, 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 the implication is that if Odysseus permits himself to uh, stay on Calypso's island to forget his homecoming, okay, um, that would be, in fact, a life not worthy of a human being, right? It would be a subhuman kind of life. Uh, an idiotic kind of life. And in that case, he would be most like um, either the suitors or the Cyclops. Uh, interesting thing is said about the Cyclops. The, the, I always tell my students the most salient feature of the Cyclops is not the single eye in the middle of the forehead. Um, and I always try to imagine, to have them imagine a young Miss Cyclops flirting with young Master Cyclops by batting her eyelid. Um, eyelash. Uh, it, it's that the Cyclopses don't ever get together in assembly and every family ignores its neighbors. In other words, Cyclops is the modern American. Okay. Uh, we, uh, everything is controlled from very far away. Um, and uh, we almost never get together in direct personal human ways to secure the common good. That's been taken out of our hands, perhaps. Um, and everybody lives for themselves, you know, uh, why we even make up our own identities now. Well, this, this is all idiotic in uh, the Greek sense of the word. So I, I'm saying that that uh, the temptation is to fall back into that. But he resists the temptation and then finally is set free. Um, anyway, uh, other questions? Dr. Esselin, uh, Esselin. Uh, Archbishop Sheen once said, you cannot build down, you can only build up. And I believe you said up, up to heaven. Uh, can you elaborate on the situation that we are seeing in society today? Oh, yeah. Well, um, okay. So, uh, I, uh, uh, the, the material that I've, that I've been teaching students for the last 30 years, 31 years, has spanned four millennia, okay, and many, many cultures. And I read a lot of languages, and I do a lot of translating from them. And it comes across to me again and again and again that, um, that there are uh, uh, natural virtues that are acknowledged wherever you go, okay, even by cannibals, um, that are now looked upon in our society with some distrust or scorn. And... Uh, I, I, I think this is an unprecedented state that we find ourselves in. I mean, look, um, let's suppose that you go, let's suppose that you go among the uh, Plains Indians in the 19th century and you find out about their uh, deeply ceremonial, in that sense, very pious and in some ways savage form of life, okay? They have very strict rules regarding marriage, right? Um, they have a uh, separation of the sexes from an early age. Uh, boys have to be trained to be warriors. There's a, there's a male initiation at around puberty 
that is extraordinary for its pain, um, uh, the so-called sun dance, look it up. I've read about it in one of my literary magazines from the 1880s by a person who was an eyewitness to it. Okay. Um, and yet, and yet, you know, that the, there's, there's common ground here, the common ground of what's basically human um, that, that a Christian missionary could build upon. But what do you do now when you go to schools? This is on my mind because of a, of a case in Ohio that I just read about, and I've written a piece about it. I'm not even sure I'm, I want to send it to be published. Where you go to our schools now, and in order to fit in, okay, in order not to be made fun of, uh, a boy can be enticed into sending ostensibly to a girl classmate nude pictures and videos of himself because he's being teased. He doesn't fit in. The opportunity comes. He says, well, I can do that, and then maybe I'll fit in. What do you do with that? I'm trying to, ima I'm trying to imagine um, all these people that talk about, oh, we need to be multicultural. I'm trying to imagine explaining that to an Onondaga chief in 1850. The Onondaga chief, who is already predisposed to look upon you with contempt for being soft, now looks upon you with a contempt bordering on complete disgust and walks away without saying a word. I mean, uh, what do you do with that? We're now not talking about uh, native customs regarding the sexes that need to be reformed, okay? We're talking about something completely demonic. Um, being accepted. And uh, even the article that I read it in, uh, an article for Catholic... Uh, Catholic um, venue from a, a Catholic website. Uh, the, 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 there, there is no, and I don't blame the author for this. The author is a very good man. Uh, there's no sense that the background to this horrible story is appalling. There's rather a sense that, well, you know, that's the way it is these days. My gosh. Um, it, it's, that's the way it is these days? Uh, that's it? What do you do with that? Um, as I say, I, th I, think the, uh, I think the case is unprecedented. If you say, well, you know, people went, uh, um, people had to go to the ancient Romans, and the ancient Romans was just utterly depraved as regards sex. That's not true. Uh, the upper classes in Rome, at their worst, we're pretty depraved. But the people out in the countryside, they weren't like that. Most people were not like that. Okay. But your vision of Roman Empire and, uh, you know, orgies, all the time, that's, that's the upper crust of the upper crust. Um, ordinary farmers are not like that at all. And uh, Christians, we're not bringing something utterly unprecedented to them. Um, they were bringing something, yeah, unprecedented in one way, but also uh, familiar in other ways, right? Um, I, the, the, the Romans didn't think that divorce was a good thing. They didn't hold parties for it. They had divorces too easily. Now these Christians come along and they don't have divorces. But that's something that a good Roman could understand. What the heck the Roman would make of what we have now, I, I don't know. Doctor, do, uh, do you have time for one more question with us this evening? I have time, yeah. I have time for I have time for a couple more questions. Awesome. Well, let's take two more here on screen. I'm going to go okay. in the order that I saw them. So let's go with Ray and then Paul. Okay. Uh, Dr. Esselin, given what you just described, uh, obviously, if you present someone the gospel, it's just dismissed out of hand. What about presenting the 
you know, the, what you just described to us, the usefulness of pagan literature, is that a gateway? I mean, is that, like, do we start there? Do we at least return them to nature so that grace can build on nature? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that a lot of that has to be done, okay? Uh, not certain of the methods to be employed. Uh, there we, you know, we're all in a, we're all in a state of being experimenters because we're in uncharted territory. But I do think a lot of the what is natural has to be has to be regained, and that includes, as regards the sexes, it includes natural boyhood and natural girlhood. Been thoroughly either frustrated or thwarted, or or perverted. Um, in the case of boys, mostly frustrated and thwarted. Um, my gosh, but uh, somebody uh, somebody just sent me an account of his um, going into obviously a private school because a public school would never have permitted it and uh, saying to a, a class of, I believe they were 12 or 13 year old kids, that it is a good and wonderful thing to be a boy and a good and wonderful thing, but a different good and wonderful thing to be a girl. That manliness is a great virtue and womanliness is a great virtue okay and you should be proud if you're a boy to be a boy and if you're a girl you should be proud to be a girl and boys and girls are for each other and six or seven of the boys after that came up to him after the, after he said so and thanked him evidently because they never heard anybody say so before and that's disgusting but the girls were largely sober. Uh, they weren't as enthusiastic about it. All these kids had been gotten to in really bad ways. And uh, maybe one thing we can do is to show how much fun, how much of sheer natural fun you regain when um, you return to uh, some kind of sanity. You know, I mean, what fun are these kids even having? What I've described is, is, is demonic, but it's also really miserable. Uh, it's dark. It, it, it's, I mean, no wonder that such that people who are living in that environment are uh, on, on antidepressants. My Lord, where's the mirth? I mean, where's the sheer fun of anything? So um, and maybe uh, 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 maybe what we need to do is first you need to get the kids out of the poisoned atmosphere. There's nothing to be done that can remedy our public schools. They're irremediable, right? Get the kid out of that poisoned atmosphere now. Um, build new schools, but uh, while we're doing this, you know, st start to teach the boys to be boys and teach the girls to be girls and sort of bring them together in wholesome and happy ways. Um, Eh, I don't know. It's it's perhaps one thing to do uh, really quickly. I, mean, I do think we need to recover the natural at all costs. I have time Paul, for another question. And... Yeah, Paul, go ahead with your question. We'll go out with this one. Okay. Hopefully I don't disappoint here. Um, <laughs> thank you, Professor. I had a question. You had mentioned uh, <clears throat> the statues and we're talking uh, around about the, uh, the culture that we live in. As a professor, I'm sure you're well aware that the university is probably the ground zero for much of the culture wars that we see uh, going on currently. Um, so I, I wonder what your opinion would be when a lot of these administrations are talking about eliminating the classics like the Odyssey or the Shakespeare's, um, again, trying to erase uh, Western civilization from history itself. Do you have any kind of uh, counter or alternative how to counter something like that? Uh, there are many ways. Um, uh, maybe one direct way is to accuse them of sheer blithering stupidity. Okay. Uh, you might say, you might say to such people, listen, you, you talk a lot about multiculturalism. I don't think you know what that word means because um, when you use it, all you have in mind is different uh, racial or ethnic flavors of one massive gray global thing that hardly qualifies as culture at all. Uh, the real storehouse of different cultures, cultures that are not ours, is the past, okay? 
Well, anybody would know that. Of course. Uh, right now, I mean, everything is more homogenized than ever before. Where are you going to learn about completely different ways of living a human life if you don't go to the past? Where are you going to you, you, you go to Germany right now and half the people speak English and we all dress the same, right? That That is nowhere near as different from us in America now as, let's say, learning about what Americans lived like in 1850 uh, would be, okay? Let alone learning uh, about 16th century Italian literature or uh, learning about first century BC Roman politics, right? Uh, why, why are you afraid? And you are afraid. Why are you afraid of all these cultures? What's the terror? Uh, that somebody might actually learn some way of being human that is not this one? Is that it? And call them out. Call them out for their, uh, for their stupidity and for their cultural imperialism. That is, they want nobody in this world to have any real culture at all. Uh, but the big global thing, the big global gray thing, everybody pretty much the same everywhere. Brussels, everywhere. <laughs> All the world of Belgium and no escape. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you could begin there. Um, the, the, the universities now, universities now are, uh, it's not just that they don't deliver. Uh, that is, they, you, you know, you you go into university, you spend, uh, you, you put your, your house in hock over the chimney um, to send your kids to college and they come out of college and they haven't learned enough to justify all that money. Um, it's that they come out of college actively stupid in ways that are not natural for human beings to be, okay? I mean, there's a certain kind of stupidity that you don't get by nature. You can only acquire this degree of stupidity by hard work and much reading, okay? Um, it's, it's as if you, are, uh, if you are administering to yourself a four-year-long lobotomy, right? And you exit from the university stupider than than any human being has any right to be, um, right? I mean, it's, it's a really marvelous achievement. Uh, we've, uh, most of the universities are beyond reform. Um, best we can do is to set up outposts of sanity here and there. And y'all might think of my college here, Magdalene College of the Liberal Arts. Um, I could be. I could have given this speech in front of my assembled students, and they would be roaring with laughter, and they would be thoroughly delighted. Uh, so, uh, uh, cast an eye our way. Cast a student or two our way. We wouldn't mind some contributions either, but uh, I think that goes without saying. Thank you so much for your uh, careful preparation and all the time spent preparing this uh, this lecture. This was this was beautiful, a wonderful. Thank evening. you. Yes, and uh, I hope that you have found and that all of us here find this also in the ICC to be one of those outposts of sanity, uh, a remedy to the uh, the nightmare that you just described in the university. Well, you know, it has been great for me. Um, I see Mara there roaring with laughter the whole time through, and it, it's, uh, I can't hear you, but I can see you. And uh, that's just so much fun. I'm, it, you made me think that my existence is justified after all. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you again from all of us. Uh, we'll go ahead and close this evening in prayer tonight. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. St. Gertrude the Great, pray for us. And St. Margaret of Scotland, pray for us. Mm -hmm.